everyone, and welcome to the History Desk Podcast. My name is Jonathan, and this is our first episode. Thank you for being here, and I hope to see you around for many exciting episodes to come. This week's episode, and our first topic, is going to be on the French and Indian War fought in the colonies of North America. Though the conflict is sometimes overlooked, it has a lot of repercussions both for the world and the continent of North America. To set the stage, what was going on? In the New World or the colonies, whichever you prefer to call them, there was a power struggle for the land. On one side sat the French, and the other the British. The French and Indian War began in 1754. Two years into the fighting, the European nations would widen the war into a global Seven Years' War. It's because of this that most people believe that the French and Indian War was the North American theater of a larger European conflict, though in the United States it's considered its own little war and not part of the larger Seven Years' War. How did we get the war? Most wars started at those times, land disputes, trading disputes. At the outbreak of the war, most of the land east of the Mississippi River was either controlled by the French or under English control. Though much of the land had no colonial settlements because at the time there was a lack of knowledge to the size of the continent. The French territories had a population of about 75,000 citizens that was centered in the St. Lawrence River Valley with some near present-day New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. There were even smaller populations near modern-day New Orleans, Louisiana, Biloxi, Mississippi, and Mobile, Alabama. The British, on the other hand, had many more settlers in the colonies than the French. At the time of the war's beginning, it is estimated that the number was approximately 1.5 million. These colonists and settlers ranged along the Atlantic coast from Nova Scotia with the colony of Newfoundland to the northern part of the province of Georgia in the southern coast. At the time the land claims were granted for these colonies, they stretched far to the west. But like we discussed earlier, that was because the size of the continent was not known at the time. As the colonies grew, they started to move towards the interior from their normal near-the-water habitats. The British had captured Nova Scotia from the French in 1713, but it still maintained a large French-speaking population. Also claimed at the time was the Rupert's Island, where the Hudson Bay Company was set up and traded furs with local Indian tribes. Besides from the French and British colonists in the region, large areas were dominated by the Native Americans. These various Native American or Indian tribes would play an important role in the conflict to come. I'll try my very best to pronounce the names of these tribes with the accuracy these people deserve, but I may not do them justice in the end, so I apologize if I mess up. In the north, the Mi'kmaq and Abenaki tribes were already engaged in Father Leprote's war against the British who had taken over Nova Scotia. Yet they still held sway in parts of Nova Scotia, Acadia, eastern portions of Canadian province, as well as much of Maine. The Iroquois Confederation held power in much of the upstate New York and Ohio country, though the Ohio country was also home to the Alquin speaking populations of Delaware and Shawnee as well as Iroquoian-speaking Mingos tribe. These smaller tribes were under Iroquois rule and were limited by them in their ability to make treaties or agreements. The Iroquois Confederation originally tried to maintain its neutrality to continue trade with both the French and the British, but it proved to be difficult as the Confederation's many tribes supported French or British causes depending on whether it helped their individual tribes or not. The southeast interior was dominated by the soan speaking Catawbas, Muscogee-speaking Creeks and Choctaw, and the Iroquoian-speaking Cherokee tribes. When the war broke out, French colonists who had used their trading connections to help recruit the tribes of the western portion of the Great Lakes region, which was not directly subject to the conflict between the French and the British. The British colonists were supported by the Iroquois Six Nations and by the Cherokees until internal problems sparked the Anglo-Cherokee War in 1758. Also in 1758, the province of Pennsylvania negotiated the Treaty of Easton, in which several tribes promised neutrality in exchange for land concessions and other considerations. Almost all of the other northern tribes sided with the French, who were their main trading partners and supplier of arms. The Creeks and the Cherokee would be subject to diplomatic efforts by both the British and the French during the conflict to either secure their help or the promise of neutrality. Then we have Spain whose influence on the continent was smaller at the time, only claiming the province of Florida. It controlled Cuba and other territories in the West Indies, 
would become military objectives of the Seven Years' War. Florida's European population was only a few hundred concentrated around St. Augustine. There were no French regular army troops stationed in America at the onset of the war. New France was defended by approximately 3,000 troops de la Marine, companies of colonial regulars, some whom had significant combat in wooded areas. The British had few troops. Most of the British colonies could muster local colonial militia to deal with Indian threats, but were generally ill-trained and only available for short times. But they did not have a standing force. Virginia, on the other hand, had a large frontier with several companies of British regulars. When hostilities began, the British colonial governments operated independently from one another and the government in London. This caused problems with negotiations with the many Indian tribes whose territories often encompassed land claimed by multiple colonies. As the war progressed, the British army establishment tried to impose constraints and demands on the colonial administrators, gaining more control of military operations. Now that the scene has been set, how did the war break out? New France's governor general at the time, Roland Michel Barin, was concerned about the growing intrusion and expanding influence of British traders in Ohio country. Because of this, in June of 1747, he ordered Pierre Joseph Saleron to lead a military expedition to the area. The goals of the expedition were to reaffirm to New France's Indian allies that their trading agreements were exclusive to New France, and to confirm Indian assistance in asserting and maintaining French claims on any territory which a French explorer had claimed, and also to impress the Indians with a show of force against British colonial incursion, unauthorized trading expeditions, and general trespasses into anywhere claimed by France. The expedition covered approximately 3,000 miles between June and November of 1749. They went up the St. Lawrence River, continued along the northern shore of Lake Ontario, crossed the Potage at Niagara, and followed the shore of Lake Erie. In Barcelona, New York, the expedition moved into the Allegheny River, which followed to the side of Pittsburgh. There, the expedition buried plates engraved with French claims to the Ohio country. Whenever the party encountered British colonial merchants or fur traders, they were informed of the French claims to the territory and told to leave immediately. When the expedition arrived in Longstown, the Indians in the area informed that them that they were the owners of the Ohio country and they would trade with the British colonists regardless of French rules. The expedition continued south until it, ex it reached the confluence of Ohio and Miami rivers, which was just south of the village of Pickawillany, the home of the Miami chief known as Old Britain. The expedition's leader threatened Old Britain with severe consequences if he continued to trade with British colonists, but Old Britain ignored the warning and the expedition was forced to retor return disappointedly to Montreal in 1749. The expedition's leader would say, the natives of these localities are very badly disposed towards the French and entirely devoted to the English. I don't know in what way we could be brought back. Even before his return to Montreal, reports of his expedition were making their way to Paris and London, each side wanting to take action. Massachusetts Governor William Shirley was particularly forceful, saying the British colonists would not be safe as long as the French were present in Europe. The War of Austrian Succession ended in 1748, but the treaty ending the war primarily focused on resolving issues in Europe. The issues of conflicting territorial claims between British and French colonists were turned over to a commission, but no decision was reached. Frontier areas were claimed by both sides, from Nova Scotia and Acadia in the north to the Ohio country in the south. The disputes also extended into the Atlantic Ocean, with both sides wanting access to the fisheries of the Grand Breaks off Newfoundland. In 1749, the British government gave land to the Ohio Company of Virginia for the purpose of developing trade and settlements in the Ohio country. The grant stated they were to settle 100 families in the territory and construct a fort for their protection. But the territory was also claimed by Pennsylvania, and both sides began to push for action to improve their respective claims. In 1750, Christopher Geist explored the Ohio Territory on behalf of both Virginia and the company, and he opened negotiation with the Indian tribes at Logstown. 1752, the Treaty of Longstown was written 
by local Indians with the British that allowed them to build a strong house at the mouth of the Monongala River on the modern side of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. France's governor general in the colonies died. He had a temporary replacement until his new replacement could get over from France. While in power, the temporary replacement was worried about continued British activity in the Ohio territories. He dispatched another military expedition. This time, 300 troops to the man's and some warriors from the Ottawa tribe. His objective was to punish the Miami people of Pick and Lewinini for not following the original expedition's orders to cease operations of trading and allowing the British to come in. On June 21st of that year, the French war party attacked the trading center at Pickawillany, capturing three traders and killing 14 Miami Indians, including Old Britain. He was the reportedly ritually cannibalized by some of the Indians in the party. In the spring of 1753, Paul Moran de la Malcu was given command of a 2,000-man force of troops de la Marine and Indians. His orders were to protect the king's land in the Ohio Valley from the British. Marin followed the route that the original expedition had mapped out four years earlier. Whereas the original expedition had left lead plates to mark French claims, Marin constructed and garrisoned forts. His first constructed Fort Plesque Island on Lake Erie's south shore near Erie, Pennsylvania, and has a road built to the headwaters of LeBeouf Creek. He constructed Fort LeBeouf in Waterford, Pennsylvania, designed to guard the waterways of LeBeouf Creek. As he moved south, he drove off or captured British traders, alarming both the British and the Iroquois. Tanagrissen was a chief of the Mingo Indians. He was remnants of Iroquois and other tribes driven west by colonial expansion. He disliked the French intensely, for whom he accused of killing and eating his father. He traveled to Fort Leboeuf and threatened the French with military action, which Marin dismissed. The Iroquois sent runners to the manor of William Johnson in upstate New York, who was the British superintendent of Indian affairs. Johnson was known to the Iroquois as Wawahigigi, meaning he who does great things. He spoke their language and had become an honorary member of the Iroquois Confederacy in the area and was made the colonel of the Iroquois in 1746 and would later become commissioned as a colonel in the Western New York militia. The Indian representatives and Johnson met with Governor George Clinton and officials from the other colonies at Albany, New York. Mohawk Chief Hendrick was Speaker of the Tribe Council, and he insisted that the British abide by their treaties and block the French expansion. Clinton did not respond to the satisfaction, and Hendrick said that the Covenant Chain, the long-standing friendship between the Iroquois Confederation and the British Crown, was now broken. Governor Robert Dinwiddie of Virginia was an investor in the Ohio Company and stood to lose a large sums of money if the French held their claim in Ohio territory. He ordered 21-year-old Major George Washington, whose brother was also an Ohio Company investor, the Virginia Regiment, to warn the French to leave Virginia territory in October of 1753. Washington left with a small party picking up Jacob Van Baan as an interpreter, Christian Geist, and a few Mingos led by Tangrissen. On December 12, Washington and his men reached Fort Leboeuf. Jacques Lagardeur de Saint-Pierre succeeded Marin as commander of the French forces after his death on October 29th. He invited Washington to dine with him. During dinner, Washington prevent, presented St. Pierre with a letter from Dinwiddie, demanding the immediate French withdrawal from the Ohio country. St. Pierre told Washington that France's claim to the region was superior to that of British's, since René Robert Calivet Sieur de la Salle had explored the Ohio country nearly a century earlier. Washington left Fort Leboeuf early on December 16th and arrived in Williamsburg on January 16th. 1754. He stated in his report that the French had swept south, detailing the steps in which they had taken to fortify the areas and their intentions to fortify the Allegheny-Monongahela rivers. Planning ahead, 
Governor Dinwiddie, even before Washington's return, sent 40 men under William Trent to the points where the rivers met to begin building a fort in the early months of 1754. Governor Dusquin, who by this time had taken his place as Governor General of New France, sent additional French forces to leave St. Pierre at the same time. The new commander led 500 men south from Fort Venago in April 1754. These forces arrived at the fort being built by Trent on April 16th, but he generally allowed Trent and his small company to withdraw, even purchasing their construction tools to continue building what would become Fort Duskane. This brings us to the opening shots of the war. Dinwiddie had ordered Washington on his return to lead a larger force to assist Trent with the construction of the fort. En route to Trent's position, Washington learned of his retreat, but Mingo Shakem Tangresen had promised to support the British, so Washington continued toward Fort Duquesne and met with him. Washington learned of the French scouting party by one of the Mingo scouts, and with adding the Mingo warriors to his own, he had a force of 52. The combined force ambushed 40 French colonists from New France, known as Canadians, on the morning of May 28th in what would be known as the Battle of Jumonville Glen. They killed many Canadians, including their commander Joseph Colomb de Jumonville, whose head was reportedly split open by the tomahawk of Tangrisson in an attempt to gain the support of the British and even his own people, who were inclined to side with the French because they had long-standing trading partners. The battle was considered by most historians to be the first shots of the French and Indian War in North America. Following the battle, Washington fell back several miles and established Fort Necessity, which would be attacked by French forces led by Jumonville's brother on July 3rd. Washington surrendered the fort, but was able to negotiate a withdrawal and the ability of his men to keep their weapons. One of his men reported that the attacking force was accompanied by Shawnee, Delaware, and Mingo warriors. News of the two battles reached England in August. After several months of negotiations, the government of the Duke of Newcastle decided to send an army expedition the following year to dislodge the French. They chose Major General Edward Braddock to lead the expedition. Word of the British military plans were leaked to France long before Braddock could depart for North America. In response, King Louis XV dispatched 6th regiments to New France under the command of Baron Descau in 1755. The British sent out their fleet in February of 1755, intending to blockade the French ports. But the French fleet had already sailed. British Admiral Edward Hawke detached a fast squadron to the Amer North American coast in an attempt to intercept the French fleet. In the second British action, Admiral Edward Bokowin fired on, the French, on a French ship on June 8, 1755, capturing her and two troop ships. The British harassed French shipping all throughout 1755, seizing ships and seamen. These actions contributed to the formal declaration of war in spring 1756. An early response to the hostilities was the convening of the Albany Congress in June and July of 1754. The goal of the Congress was to formalize a unified front in the trade negotiations with various Indians since the allegiance of the various tribes and nations would be a pivotal role in the war that was unfolding. The plan that the delegates agreed to was neither ratified by the colonial legislatures nor approved by the Crown. Nevertheless, the format of the Congress and many of the specifics of the plan became the prototype for the Confederation during the War of Independence to come in the future. And there we have it. The sides have been set. The first shots have been fired. The French and Indian War is now underway in North America, and its outcome will shape the continent for the future like no other before it. Please tune in next week as we go through the events of the war, the victories, and the defeats, and the eventual outcomes. We will go over what post-war North America would look like and what lasting problems the war would have for both the French and its colonies, and the British and its colonies. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, please leave, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you would like to support the show, you can find us on Patreon. Just search the History Desk or find the link in the show notes. All donations will go to improving the quality of the show. If you want to continue the discussion of this week's episode, find us on Facebook, where some visual material will also be posted as well. Until then, we'll see you next week. Have a great day.